Hello, my name is Jo Morgan. I'm a maths teacher and I'm the writer of the blog resourceaholic.com. Um, today I'm going to do a presentation for you that I did at Research Ed Rugby in 2019. Uh, the presentation is called Multiplication Madness and it's about whether Gove was correct in his decisions that he made about multiplication algorithms. Now, when I presented this um, workshop at Research Ed Rugby last year, I did it in two parts. The first part was quite practical. People did some maths. Um, we tried out some methods for multiplication. I chose a particularly quirky ancient one that I knew that people wouldn't have seen before. And we had some fun playing with that and trying to prove why it works. Um, and I talked about um, all these different types of multiplication. And, and when I say different methods, I mean stuff like uh, the column method, the grid method. Um, most teachers will be familiar with the lattice method, sometimes called gelosia, it's got a few other names. Um, some teachers will know Russian peasant multiplication, Egyptian multiplication. They're so much fun to play with. And if you don't know these methods, um, then do explore, find out about them. Um, you could do that by reading my book, A Compendium of Mathematical Methods, um, or there are other resources you can use to explore these different ways of multiplying that have been used throughout history and are used in all different countries in the world. Um, and they're so much fun. Um, they might not change the way you teach multiplication but they're certainly interesting to play with um, and they do give you quite a lot of insight into how multiplication works and how we can how we can manipulate it and and how all these different methods um, can help build understanding so I really recommend um, doing that although it's not something that I'm going to do in today's presentation because I don't think it really works online it works best if I'm in the room and we do this as a sort of group activity where everyone's having a go this is a particularly good activity for exploring multiplication methods. This is a SMILE resource and um, I saw it last year at the ATM MA conference at Easter when I went to a session run by STEM Centre um, and they had a load of SMILE resources we could play with and this was one of them and I absolutely loved it um, because a couple of these I couldn't quite figure out how they worked at first, particularly method E, um, which I now know what it is because I've done my research onto that and I know it really well, but at the time I just couldn't see what was going on with method and it's so rewarding once I figured it out and it's a really really fantastic method um, this is a great resource and this is one you can use with students or you could use for your own subject knowledge development you can get this from STEM Center if you look up um, multiplication um, it's a smile resource then you can find it pretty easily and it really is worth having a go at like I say we're not going to do that today but this was in the original talk I did at research ed rugby so if we take out that first part of the session, that's gone. And um, the second part of my workshop was about um, prescription of methods. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. Um, but really, we're going to talk about what Gove did, what his intention was, and whether it was the right decision. So I guess the question is, what did Gove actually do? Now, I'm talking about when Gove was um, Education Secretary, um, and he made a lot of changes during his time. And one of them, um, was a change that affected primaries and a lot of secondary teachers um, didn't know about it really at the time or, or perhaps still don't know that this, this happened even though it was quite a few years ago now um, because it, it hasn't really had a huge impact um, on the way we do things but I think it's it's quite it's an interesting thing that he did and it's quite fundamental. It, it, it's quite a, a bold move um, in terms of the kind of level of involvement of politics in education and particularly in this case, politics in mathematics and this idea of politicians telling mathematicians um, how they should be doing their maths is really interesting and really quite um, surprising that they would they would do this. Now, at the end of um, year six, which is when children are 10 or 11 years old, uh, the year before they start secondary school, they take um, exams, uh, key stage two SATs, um, and they sit maths exams in arithmetic and reasoning, two reasoning papers, one arithmetic paper. Um, and these were all reformed, um, what, about five, six years ago now, everything, um, all the changes were announced. And one of the changes, um, which um, was um, controversial at the time, and there was a lot of debate at the time about whether it was um, acceptable and, um, and a reasonable and a, and a good idea, was this idea of, um, for long multiplication and long division, limiting the marks that a child can get for their method, depending on the method they used. 
Now, if I show you this little extract from the, um, the, the instructions that come with the test, it says that uh, long division and long multiplication questions are worth two marks each, and you'll be awarded two marks for a correct answer, and you may get one mark for showing a formal method. Now, formal method is not something that is defined in mathematics. That is not a mathematical phrase. Um, formal method is something that might not mean anything to um, people watching this from other countries because there is no such thing as a formal method um, that is not classified or defined um, in this country or as far as I know anywhere in the world. What do we mean by formal? Um, and this is where it gets really interesting and I'll explain, I'll show you um, in a minute um, what, what is meant by formal. But this idea of prescription of methods is really quite surprising and it only is happening in key stage two. So that is these SATs, these exams that children take when they're say 11 years old. So in secondary school, in GCSE and A-level, there is definitely no prescription of methods. Children can use any method um, to solve a question, unless it specifically says in the question something to do with, you say, for example, it might be a question where they say you may not use trial and error, you have to use an algebraic method, but that's quite unusual. For the vast majority of questions, children can use any method that gets them an answer. And really, that's something we celebrate and we, and we um, encourage in mathematics, this sort of diversity of approach and really that's something that, that makes us mathematicians is that we all have our own ways of looking at things and we all have our own ways of solving things and when people mark GCSE and A-level exams they should be able to recognise and follow all these different methods and understand what that student was doing and whether they are able to get any method marks. It's really unusual and really quite surprising that at Key Stage 2 there is a, a decision has been made about what methods are worthy of marks. Now here we can see some questions from a Key Stage 2 exam. So these are the exams that students sit at 11 years old. Um, and we can see some examples of multiplication questions. Uh, there's some interesting things about this. There are only two marks each. There's quite a lot to do. There's quite a lot that can go wrong if they make a little um, slip with their arithmetic. Um, that second question is definitely longer than we would, a uh, bigger question than we'd see um, at GCSE. And when I say bigger, I mean at GCSE, I don't think I've ever seen a four digit by two digit multiplication being asked. Um, it's not the sort of thing that GCSEs test. It's not the sort of thing we're interested in testing at GCSE. Um, the, the, this is very much testing an algorithm. And there we can see the prescribed method because we can see the layout of the question. It's very clear that this question is forcing or leading students to a column method by the way the question is presented. So in that first one, it doesn't say work out 785 times 23 written horizontally it's specifically drawn out and written in the way that you would start off a column method um, algorithm so basically that's the method that children are being led towards and even even the the, the way that it's formatted here takes them down that route um, really unusual to if for someone who's used to looking at GCSE to see the way the questions are laid out but also to see um, just how sort of how how big that question is particularly the second one in terms of it being lots and lots of steps and really um, I suppose the question is is it necessary for it to be quite so big um, I guess we want to see if they can do the algorithm. I guess if we want to see that they, um, we're not testing if they understand multiplication in any way here. We are literally just testing, can they follow the steps they've been taught? Now the mark schemes. Oh, I should mention calculators. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't learn long multiplication because we have calculators in life. I mean, if we use the idea of we have the technology, why learn the maths? then there'll be a lot of maths that we just would never bother learning. In fact, perhaps all maths, because we have things like Wolfram Alpha that can just do it all for us. That's not why we learn maths, and that's not really an argument that I want to get into here. But what I would say is, um, there used to be a time when people had to do lots and lots of long, big multiplications by hand. Um, before calculators were invented, there were lots of jobs that required this kind of thing to be done. Now, those jobs don't exist anymore because anything that requires multiplication to be done would be done using some kind of computer or calculator. So there is no kind of life need to do these long multiplications that involve large numbers multiplied by large numbers. There's no, there's no reason for that. The argument for anything that we teach in maths is 
that it should lead to further maths. So it should. So being able to do this should help us to access more things along the way. They say all roads lead to calculus. Um, so you could argue that all the things we do at primary and throughout secondary are taking us on a journey to be able to do maths at a higher level. Um, which all has obviously a great purpose. Um, so it, I don't think it's, I think the fact that, that we would never need to do this in our lives is not a reason not to do it. Um, however, the size of the calculations by hand, oh, I kind of find it a little bit um, frustrating. I think testing a two digit by two digit is probably sufficient, really. Um, but let's have a look at the MART schemes, because the MART schemes showing us that formal method that's required. So if you look at the mark scheme for the first question, two marks for correct answer. That means if someone used, say, a grid method and they got it right, they do get the two marks, that's fine. But then it says if the answer's incorrect, we get one mark for a formal, that word formal, method of long multiplication. Now, again, they're not defining formal there, but it is defined elsewhere, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, and they're saying um, this, and they give the examples of what that formal method would look like. So we can all see it's the column method that they're describing as formal. Um, but so that's where the, that's, this is the big change that came in. This is the big thing that Gove introduced. Um, and what this means is, it doesn't mean that primary schools aren't teaching, um, say, grid methods or partial product methods or all sorts of other things that are helping to build the understanding. But they do they do have to make sure that their, their children in primary school, so the teachers need to make sure that children can use this algorithm, this column multiplication algorithm, um, with great accuracy um, in order to do well in their SATs. Um, and whether or not that's that's important um, to do well in SATs is another thing for, up to, for debate. Um, but the we know, therefore, that our year sevens coming in will definitely have learnt um, a column method. So that means that we've got that consistency coming in. Um, and it means that some of them may have seen a grid, some of them may not. What we don't know is anything about their level of understanding of multiplication, because we know that being able to follow this algorithm doesn't really tell us much about that. Um, but it also means that we may have children coming in who have this kind of idea of, of set methods, of maths having to be about you have to do it this way, um, which, which is a, something I think makes us a bit uncomfortable, this idea of um, prescription of methods and, and only one right way. Now, the, um, the National Curriculum Document for Maths for Primary School includes these examples of the formal written methods. Um, and you can see this is standard column method. Um, you can see that the um, examples given are very much what we might call a traditional method, um, a method that's been around a long time, but so have lots of other methods. OK, lots of other methods have been around a long time as well. So I think when people describe this as a traditional method, um, perhaps they're thinking traditional in a fairly short space of time. Maybe they're thinking this is the dominant method over the last, say, 100 years. Um, but actually, there's lots of ancient methods or methods that have been around forever that we could also describe as traditional. So I, I'm reluctant to use that word, but I'm even more reluctant to use the word formal. Um, the word formal surprises me. What on earth do we mean by formal? Um, I'm kind of imagining a method in a, in a dinner jacket. Like, what is this, this formality of methods? Um, I, I looked up formal to see the various different meanings of it. And I think the meaning that's used here, the dictionary definition, is officially sanctioned or recognised. So what they're saying is that the, the column method for multiplication is officially sanctioned by our government. And I think every mathematician in the world is, is cringing at that. How dare the government sanction methods? It is not their place to sanction methods. Like this is, this is not good stuff for mathematicians to hear this idea of the government saying that one particular method is sanctioned. Um, one method is allowed. Like mm, we're, we're not happy with that. Um, but that really interested me that they've used the word formal. And by formal, they mean this is the method that we are saying is OK. So I guess the big question is why prescribe formal methods? What was uh, the government's driver for doing this? Um, what made they th made them think it would be a good idea to do this? And um, and and was it the right decision? And was this the right choice of method to make formal? Now the um, 
this was back in 2013, and this is an example of an article at the time. There was a lot of debate about it at the time, but for people like me, and I was fairly new to teaching in 2013, you know, I've been teaching a few years, but I wasn't involved in Twitter. I wasn't really engaging in research or in um, just knowing what's going on um, outside my own school. Um, and so I missed all this. And if you look at this article, time to knock chunks out of key stage two maths. Now, let me just explain chunking. Um, Chunking is a method for division. So it's an alternative to the bus stop method. <laughs> Sorry, I laugh because we shouldn't call it that. I don't know why people call it the bus stop method. Um, long multiplication or sh oh, sorry long division or short division um people for a while said gosh those are so algorithmic and so um students do it with no understanding of what's going on um, which again is debatable um but then uh, schools introduced chunking instead now what's really interesting is um a few uh, last year i worked with a spanish secondary school student and when i asked her to do a division she did an amazing method which she'd learned back in spain um, which was quite similar to chunking so what that made me realize was that this method of um that's used for division that's that's kind of been been removed from primaries in a way maybe not all primaries but basically was we were told by the government this is not a good way to do things it's actually quite popular in other parts of the world or very similar methods are because there's a lot of logic and a lot of understanding in them so that's chunking now i'm not talking about division today so i'm going to avoid references to chunking um, she's also talking about gridding and by that she just means your standard grid method um, which i'm sure all math teachers are familiar with so this is um and this is education minister elizabeth truss and she says that chunking and gridding are confusing and time consuming. Um, so this was kind of the start of, um, it's, it was a big debate, but this was the start of, of her saying, um, we shouldn't be using these methods. And then, and then I suppose they went off and thought, how can, as a government, how can we stop primaries from using these methods? So they kind of got this big kind of vendetta or this anger against these methods, and they decided they wanted them gone, um, which I find quite surprising. Um, and I, and I, they must have been advised by mathematicians along the way, I would hope so. Um, but certainly there isn't agreement about any of this. So it's surprising that they went to the point of um, introducing measures to basically remove these methods from from um, teaching. So, you know, the, the idea is that by the way that the government controls teaching tends to be by controlling assessment. Um, so, for example, if they want to teach a specific thing in secondary school, then they'll change the GCSE to make us teach that. So that's the way the government manages to control um, is through national curriculum and is through assessment. And that's how the government kind of exercises control over what is taught in schools. Now, this is uh, Liz Truss in her very famous cheese speech. And let's look at some of the stuff that Liz said about methods at the time. So Liz was an education minister um, and she had some um, interesting things to say about multiplication and division methods. She said that chunking and gridding are tortured techniques. Oh, tortured is the word she uses to describe our lovely mathematics. Um, but they have become the norm in recent years. Children just end up repeatedly adding or subtracting numbers and batches of numbers. She also says they may not give the right answer. Sorry, they may give the right answer, but they are not quick, efficient methods, nor are they methods that children can build on and apply to more complicated problems. Now, I have a lot of issues with what she's just said there, and we're going to pull this, uh, all of this apart in a minute. We're going to go through this piece by piece and say, what is she saying that's actually got some, uh, got some truth in it and what she's saying that's not quite right? Column methods of addition and subtraction, short and long multiplication and division are far simpler, far quicker, far more effective and allow children to understand properly the calculation and therefore move on to more advanced problems. Now, particularly that very last bit is, is just wrong. Um, and I'm going to explain why I think it's wrong. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm quite angry with all of what's written here because there's so much in it that is um, really needs to be questioned and, and, and just not accepted. Um, what she's saying here um, has got a lot of holes in it. Um, and I either was very poorly researched or was just totally um, a political agenda and um, who cares about the research. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about this all in a lot more detail. 
Now, looking back to coverage on this um, from back in sort of 2013, um, I found um, a teacher who'd written um, to Tez about their correspondence with the government on this issue. Now, they'd written to the government to question the decision to say whether the government was saying that grids are bad and column is good. And this teacher had written in to question that decision. And they got um, this back. Um, they were informed that grids lead nowhere, but long multiplication leads to further mathematics. Now, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, in the next email, they backtracked, they changed their mind and they said, actually, we're just doing this because um, high performing countries use column methods. Um, so this is really interesting because here I'm gathering information on why the government decided to introduce the prescribed formal methods. And I now have a number of reasons looking at this and looking at the things that Liz Charles has said in the media and all these other things. We can gather together a list of here are the reasons the government gave. So I've pulled together um, four reasons why the government um, justified, how they justified prescribing the column method for multiplication in primary schools. So the first um, reason they gave was that it's to do with speed. They thought that grid methods are time consuming and column methods are more efficient. The second reason they gave was that grid methods lead nowhere, but long multiplication leads on to, oh, sorry, column method for long multiplication leads on to further maths. They then said that column methods are used in high performing countries. Um, and then they said that grids are confusing, but column methods are simple, more effective and allow children to actually understand what's going on. So I'm going to address each of these four points in turn. I'm going to go through and decide whether there's truth in each of those things. Now, I haven't seen any evidence that um, column methods are significantly more efficient than grid methods. Um, there are definitely pros and cons of each method, and I don't want anyone thinking that I am a big fan of grid and I hate the column method, because actually I did the column method at school. Um, I, um, it's the default method for me, because that's what I was taught, um, and that's what I've used for my whole life. Um, I'm not anti-column method, um, but I would like to see some research evidence that it is significantly quicker. Um, perhaps that evidence exists. I haven't come across it. I've seen lots of studies about subtraction methods from back from when there was a big battle between different ways of doing subtraction, which was a massive thing, particularly in the early 1900s, the, the decision of how to best do subtraction um, was something that that was a huge, um, a huge subject of debate and research. Um, I'm assuming that similar studies have been done for multiplication, but I haven't seen them. Um, I haven't been able to get hold of any. And I guess the question is, is the column method more efficient, quicker than the grid method? Um, now, looking at this, I'd be surprised because the column method for the same problem has double the number of steps. There's all this fiddly uh, carrying or exchanging or whatever you want to call it. There's all this, all these sort of um, little bits to do and it actually ends up being 10 steps as opposed to five. It doesn't take long to draw the grid out at all, probably a millisecond more than writing out the multiplication in a column. So I'm quite surprised um, that anyone would think that it's far quicker. I mean, the words far quicker really surprise me. It may be marginally quicker, but, but who cares? Now, the big question is, does efficiency matter? Do we really care if methods are quicker or slower than other methods? Well, when I'm choosing a method to um, teach my students, let's say I'm choosing um, a method for how I'm going to teach them how to factorise a non-monic quadratic, because that's one where there's quite a few methods to choose from, or a method for how to um, how to divide algebra or how to expand double brackets, all these things that I actually have a plethora of methods I can choose from. Um, and I'm, efficiency is definitely not the main thing that I'm thinking about. I don't want them to do a method that takes forever, but there really aren't many of them. Um, I, and I suppose in an exam like at A level, where there is actually quite a lot of time pressure, I do want to think a little bit about, um, is there a quicker way of doing something? However, when I do long uh, division, uh, algebraic division for polynomials at A level, I don't choose synthetic division, which they do in many parts of the world, even though I know it is by far the quickest method. Um, so actually I choose not to choose the most efficient methods 
often. So do I think efficiency matters? Not really, and certainly not as much as it used to. Um, have a look at this. This is a beautiful old bit of mathematics, extraction of a cube root, very, very fiddly, done with um, a quill and some ink and um, in, in sort of great detail and very, very carefully, very long calculation to do, would have taken an extremely long time. Now, if I could have saved time on that, if I'm back in the 1800s and I could save some time on my arithmetic, then yes, please. Um, that argument doesn't really hold anymore. Um, we aren't doing this massive masses of arithmetic in life. And um, back when people were bookkeepers and they were having to do endless additions and multiplications and it had to all be spot on accurate and they had to check everything. So everything had to be done twice. Yeah, efficiency mattered. Efficiency doesn't matter like it used to. We're not all about speed in maths. We're about understanding and we're about um, enjoying all the problem solving and the reasoning. And we're not all about trying to just do loads of arithmetic really quickly. There was a time where maths had to be about that to some extent, not all maths, but there were people whose jobs involved that a lot, not anymore. Um, before calculators were invented, mathematicians had to look for more efficient ways of doing things. And it was um, Leibniz who said, it's unworthy of excellent men to lose hours like slaves in the labour of calculation. So he's saying you get these excellent people, these, these very, very smart mathematicians, and they were just losing all their time, all their time where they could be doing amazing things. They were losing it to doing all these annoying calculations. Efficiency mattered. And if they had a quick method then, then they would use it. This is not what things look like for us anymore. So uh, for arithmetic, efficiency of methods has really fallen in our priorities. Um, if we cared about efficiency, um, then we wouldn't be using the column method because the column method is not the quickest way to multiply. If I'm multiplying two numbers and I want the quickest method, I reckon Vedic methods are better. Uh, diagonally and crosswise and, and you know, there's all there's all sorts of ways you can multiply in a quicker um, method that doesn't no one really knows what's going on with it. You know, it seems like a trick. It's very, very quick. There's no understanding. But hey, it's quick. So if we're going for efficiency, we haven't chosen the most efficient. So let's not use efficiency as an argument for using the column method. OK, that argument doesn't hold if more efficient methods exist and if efficiency doesn't really matter in this day and age. So our drivers the, the, for the prescribing the column method, our list of four things for what the government said was there reasons for doing this? Our first one, efficiency, I'm saying I'm not sure it's true. I'm not convinced that the column method is quicker than the grid method, at least not significantly so. And also, I think it's irrelevant. Who cares about efficiency? So let's look at the next method on our list, or sorry, the next driver on our list, which was that the government said that grids lead nowhere while long multiplication leads to further mathematics. Now, I think you can guess what I'm going to say here. So apparently grids lead nowhere, um, and that's, we know, nonsense. But more interesting is the fact that the government is trying to tell us that column methods lead somewhere, um, because I really don't think they do. Um, they used to, and it was definitely true in the 1800s. Um, if you wanted to expand, um, multiply polynomials in the 1800s, you would have set your working out like this. Now, this is the uh, column method for multiplication, but used for algebra instead of numbers. Um, and it absolutely made sense that children were taught to do this with numbers in primary school, and then they'd be taught to do this with algebra, and the layout was the same. Now, teachers in the UK don't use this method commonly. I'm not saying there aren't the odd one that use it, but not that I know. Um, I have seen this in textbooks from other countries, so it certainly is used in other parts of the world still. But in this country, we stopped using this. It was common in the 1800s. We don't do it anymore. So to say that the column method for multiplication leads us on to further mathematics baffles me, because apart from multiplying algebra, which we don't do anymore in this method, um, I can't think of anything that we do at secondary that uses that same method that column multiplication uses. I can't think of a thing. Maybe I'm missing something. So that, to say that the column method leads to further mathematics, that confuses me. To say that grids lead nowhere 
obviously confuses me because we all know that grids lead to a lot of places. Um, when um, I expand uh, binomials, um, I just write them in double brackets and work horizontally. Um, although this year, for the first time, I taught my students both methods. So I taught them the way that I do it, which is basically um, write them horizontally and do each by each. Um, but I also showed them the grid method and about half of them decided that would be their method of choice. They really liked the grid method. Um, lots and lots of teachers use the grid method and it comes up all over the place. It's very, very helpful to use it when you're expanding triple brackets because when you particularly when you get to this stage so you've done your first double bracket expansion and then you've got to multiply by another binomial it's really helpful to use a grid because it helps um, really keep track of what you're doing um, it's not essential but it's really helpful so grids actually are pretty powerful in lots and lots of different parts of maths Um, I like this by James Tanton, where he shows, um, he's kind of poking fun at it a little bit, but he's showing kind of four stages of learning about multiplication. And he says, you know, in, we start off with this idea of um, partitioning the numbers and we've got this grid layout and we can understand um, how the how the products fit together. And then he says, well, if we take away the visual aid, I mean, the, the beauty of the grid is that it's showing that um, it's helping us to see what are we multiplying by what? So which which kind of part of the factors do we need to multiply together at each stage? And he said, if we take the visual way, we get this partial products method, which I actually quite like. I like this layout. Um, you have to keep track of what you're doing without the kind of guidance to show what you're doing that you get in the grid. Um, but you can keep track of it yourself and you still get those four partial products that you can add. And actually, you could argue that that column layout is easier for the adding, whereas the grid method is, is harder to add them. You might have to write them separately to add them up. Um, this actually, with this uh, partial products layout is also very helpful and then he said oh for when ink is precious we can go to a column method um, and that really made me chuckle but he's absolutely right it's like why why are we kind of combining those rows in the partial product method um, why is it that we feel the need to sort of save this space and to squish everything in um, and so I think that's that's really funny that he says for when ink is precious. And then he says that then we end up we go to um, we get to a higher level of mathematics and we're multiplying algebra. And that's where lots of people are using grids. So we've come full circle. We've sort of almost gone through this unnecessary stage of using um, a column method. And we've ended up back where we started. Now, that's not the case for every teacher. And it's not to say because not everyone uses grids um, at secondary school. Um, certainly, you know, there are you can use grids for all sorts of things. Not everyone does. Um, but it is interesting to think of that progression and to think, you know, we have this sort of understanding and then we squish it down into an algorithm and then we bring it all out into those um, partial products, um, which really kind of tell us what's going on. Um, and it's, and it's um, an interesting thing to have a think about. Now, it's interesting to look at something that was um, published a couple of years before um, all these changes um, were suggested for um, primaries and the methods they're allowed to use. This was published by Ofsted in 2011, and it was called Good Practice in Primary Schools, Evidence from 20 Successful Schools. And Ofsted massively praised grid methods. They could see the advantages. They could see that these were something that schools should be using. Um, and it seems that their opinion perhaps wasn't taken into account or wasn't considered important in the changes that came only a few years later. So they said uh, one of the advantages of learning the grid method is it can be used for later for work on multiplying decimals, for um, multiplying algebraic expressions and expressions involving certs. And these are all great uses of grid methods. Um, so they were really positive about schools using grids, primary schools using grids. Um, and they said it's really good because it emphasizes those four products and it, and it kind of stops these uh, common mistakes happening. So for example, if you look at the binomials there, 2x plus 3 multiplied by x minus 6, then we don't want anyone doing the 2x times the 3. But by laying it out in a grid, it's really clear what should be multiplied by what. Um, they also mentioned that this makes some of these harder um, topics more accessible to um, students who who otherwise might have struggled with them. So students who are asked to expand brackets sort of horizontally um, might st uh, struggle or, you know, the each by each method, I mean, might struggle until they're given a grid and then they might find it more accessible. So Ofsted were very, very in favour of the grid method, um, which was then basically it, it wasn't long after that that, um, that 
that the primary schools were told really they are allowed to teach the grid but um, they're to tell students that they should avoid using it um, so that's a really kind of strange um, kind of uh, juxtaposition of of ideas from people that really or bodies that really should be um, agreeing with each other or at least um, giving us the same message now if we come back to those four reasons for why the government decided that the column method should be prescribed and should be made the formal method first of all we had the fact that uh, columns uh, column method is more efficient and i'm saying i don't think that's necessarily true um, and if even if it is i don't think it's relevant and then we were told that grid methods lead nowhere and uh, column methods lead to further mathematics and i'm saying no that's nonsense i that one i just can't get on board with uh, so let's look at the next reason on the list which is that long multiplication is used Used in high performing countries. Now for this I've looked at a Japanese textbook. Um, I love Japanese textbooks, they are fantastic. Um, and um, we're looking at a chapter called um, multiplication algorithms. Basically the whole thing is about how to use algorithms in multiplication. Um, these are primary textbooks um, and they are really, really well written, definitely worth having a look at. So here's the beginning of the chapter, the kind of uh, introduction to the chapter says, let's look at these calculations one through to six and let's say which of these can we already do and which of these do we not know how to do. Now at this stage, children would have learned their times tables and note that in high performing, performing countries, children really get a lot of help with their times tables at home. It's very cultural there that families help with education and so families would have helped their children get really good at times tables and they don't put all of the burden on the schools to do that, whereas in this country I saw the schools have to do it and, and families do very little to help with teaching times tables um, which is one of the reasons why these countries where the cultural differences are so far ahead in terms of mathematics and um, so children would have learnt their times tables they'll know them really well they'll know them fluently and that means they can do questions one two and three here because they know their times tables but they won't yet know how to do four five and six because for that they'll need some other way of multiplying um, which they haven't yet learnt so this is the beginning of the chapter chapter on multiplication algorithms. Now the whole chapter starts off, I'm not showing you the whole chapter, but, but it does start off with this lovely sort of idea of um, uh, it's got visuals, it really tries to explain how things are broken down and how they work. So we're talking about 12 times 23 here. You can see that they've drawn out all the little, uh, the 12 are drawn out as, as a 10 and two ones. And we're saying we've got 20 lots of them. And we've also got another three lots of them. So we've broken down that um, calculation into tw uh, 20 lots of 12 and three lots of 12. And then we can see that process of combining those to get 23 lots of 12. Um, it's the same way we'd explain it in this country, um, but it's, it's in interesting to look at just the visuals they use and then how they introduce the topic. Um, the algorithm is then introduced very quickly and it is the column method. So perhaps the government are right here. I mean, I, this is only one high performing jurisdiction, but to say that in high performing jurisdictions, the column method is used, perhaps that is correct because here we can see it being used. Um, it's exactly the same as we would do it in this country, other than the fact that we tend to use zero as a placeholder. You can see here when they did the uh, 12 times the 20, and wrote that in the second row of the products, they've written 24 and not 240. They've left a gap rather than put a zero. Um, some people in this country do it like that, but in, we tend to put a zero in as our placeholder. Um, it's not a huge difference, but it's just something that's interesting to note because sometimes you'll see students who leave a gap. Um, if you look at textbooks from the 1800s, they tended to leave a gap. Um, they didn't put those zeros in that we now put in looks in high performing jurisdictions they're learning the multiplication algorithm in a very similar way to how we would learn it Now the um, next question in that same exercise 
is thinking about 86 times 30. And you can see they have two different methods laid out there. They have one where they've um, stuck with the algorithm, which the algorithm says do the ones column and sorry, do the ones row and then do the tens row. Um, so their ones row has just got zeros in and then they've got the tens row with the 258. Um, and then the other method says, well, we haven't got anything in our ones row, so we don't need a ones row in our in our partial products. We can just go ahead with the uh, it's multiplying by 30, which means putting a zero in that first column and then multiplying by three. Um, so the question is, um, what idea did the boy use to make the algorithm easier to calculate? Um, and then let's have a go at these questions, which ask, uh, you know, which are similar, where we do, we don't need to have that uh, column of, oh, sorry, that row of zeros, um, which um, which which is just such a, such a, a crazy thing to do. Like we just that row that row of zeros is 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 done by following the algorithm without really even looking at the question. And question four in the same exercise says, well, look, we've got three times 46. And if you look at the way the boy's laid it out, he's ended up with two uh, two rows of partial products because he's doing three times six and he's separately doing three times 40 and he's adding them together. Whereas the way the girl's done it, she's put the bigger number at the top and it means that she can just do um, six times three and uh, three times four in one go, one row of working, she's got straight to the answer. Um, and it says we can, we're can we using a property of multiplication here. So it's asking students to think, what is it that means we can change this order? Um, and then it gives them some examples of questions where they can change the order um, in order to make the algorithm work better for them. So they're being taught an algorithm and they're being taught to manipulate that algorithm and understand it enough that they can use it efficiently. And I'm not saying we don't do this in this country. I just think it's really interesting to look at the way that their textbook is laid out and the way that, um, that things are explained and taught. I think it's a really nice textbook to have a look through. Um, in the same textbook, we see um, these what they call mastery problems. Um, and the first one um, is about correcting mistakes in calculations. Um, and this is something we use that's used all over the world. It's a really great technique to use in maths. Um, but I really like the little bit at the bottom where they're estimating. So it says if I estimate an answer for the calculation 50 times 30, well, we know we get 1,500, which is what tells us that that 240 in that answer is way out. Like we know that's wrong. So now now we can look at it and say, well, what's gone wrong with it? Because we know that answer doesn't make sense. And, and as we'd expect, it's a place value issue. I mean, you know, they've got that they've got that one for four in the wrong place, um, which is the most common mistake that children make on multiplication problems. Um, but this is this is a standard technique, spot the mistake, and it's interesting to see it used um, in textbooks from other countries. Um, here's another one. Uh, the two children are explaining why the 252 was shifted one place, and they the children have to say, um, or the students have to say, who do we think is explaining it correctly? So this is this is not not no different really to how we teach it in this country. There's a real focus on understanding the algorithm, um, but we can certainly see that the algorithm in use here is the column method, um, and that means that the government is correct in saying that it's used in high performing jurisdictions. It doesn't mean that we should do something just because they do it in high performing jurisdictions, but the government is correct in saying that that is what is happening. We can see the column method in use here. I don't know how much research they've done in Japan to figure out what the best method is and whether this is the most appropriate way to teach it. Um, but I certainly think that um, that to, for the government to say it's used in high performing jurisdictions, um, I can't say that they are wrong about that. So if we come back to our four methods for why the government decided that the column method was the right one to prescribe and why they felt that prescription was necessary at all, um, we had the efficiency thing which I don't think is necessarily true and I don't think it's important. We had the thing about um, grids leading nowhere um, and column methods leading somewhere, which I think is wrong. And we had the thing about long multiplication being used in a high performing jurisdictions, so countries that do very well at maths. And I'm going to say, yeah, the, the government are probably right about that. Uh, the final point they made was that grid methods are confusing, while column methods are simpler, far more effective and allow children to understand properly the calculation. So they're saying that when children use a column method, they really get the maths. That's what the government's saying. So let's have a quick look at that. Now let's have a look at a calculation. 
Uh, let's think about 153 times 243. It's quite a lot to do here because it's three digit by three digit. So what we're really doing is 153 multiplied by, and we've partitioned that um, 243 into 200 plus 40 plus three, and then we're going to multiply each part separately. So we're going to have three lots of 153, 40 lots of 153, and 200 lots of 153. Now, if we were to uh, set that out in a lovely, colourful column layout, then using the colour particularly, we can really see what's going on here. We want the first row in our partial products is three lots of 153. The second row is 40 lots of 153. And then the next row, which is in blue in this diagram, in this, in this uh, layout at the top there, is 200 lots of 153 and then we can add them all together and it's laid out nicely because it's ready to add it's in a format that's ready for column addition which is a great advantage of this method um, the thing that we just have to pause on slightly here, because that all looks really straightforward, um, is that those multiplications themselves are not that straightforward to do. Um, so, for example, when you do the 153 times 40, um, when you do the 4 times 3, you get 12, and then you're spilling over into another column. So, actually, that itself needs breaking down, and that's what some methods do better than the column method. So here, we're trying to do 153 times 40 all in one go. Um, and in order to do that, we have to write all these annoying little carry numbers that are just floating around. Um, and that's the, that's the kind of tricky bit, and that's the bit that's not so great about this method. Um, that 153 times 40 is not something that's just straightforward and we can write it down. And other methods break it down for you, and the column method doesn't. The column method kind of bundles things up, and, and there's this kind of higher sort of cognitive load of trying to sort of remember where you are and what's going on. Now, there's an ATM journal um, article called Algorithms, Alcatraz, Are Children Prisoners of Process? And what they're suggesting is that when you learn something that's very algorithmic, so you're following a method without necessarily really knowing how that method works, you're told to write certain numbers in certain places, but you don't necessarily know why those numbers go in those places, um, then you become almost a prisoner of that algorithm, which means that you don't use the algorithm as effectively as you should. And when we looked at that Japanese textbook, we saw all these different examples of how to adapt the algorithm depending on the question. And if children aren't taught to understand the algorithm properly, then they don't use it in the best way. Um, so if, for example, and this is just an extract from, a, from an excellent article, and um, this is a small extract which says that um, children who were asked to calculate 23 times 400, um, they decided to write the larger number at the top because they think that's what they're meant to do. So they write 400 times 23. And then and then the way they work it out is they do the three times the zero and the three times the zero and the three times the four. And then they do the 20 times the zero and the 20 times the zero and the 20 times the four. And then they add those together. Whereas we know that the more efficient way to do it would be 23 times four. And then we're going to multiply that by 100. So we're going to have those zeros at the end. Um, and, and it's that kind of like, oh, the bigger number goes on top. And, and that kind of idea of not really thinking about the question. Um, and it was interesting that even though they already knew what 23 times 4 was, they still persisted with drawing it out like this. So if you know 23 times 4 and you're asked to do 23 times 400, why draw the column method out? You're just multiplying your 92 by 100 there. Um, and then they were asked other questions, like they were asked 2,300 times 4, but they already knew what 23 times 4 was. And they still try to use the algorithm. And they were asked 2.3 times 4. So they just had to take the 23 times 4 and divide it by 10. But they still use the algorithm. So they were kind of slaves to this algorithm. Um, and that's quite worrying, that kind of idea of being, being told you must, under all circumstances, you must use this algorithm. You will only get marks if you use this algorithm. And then this idea of, well, sometimes the algorithm is just totally inappropriate. Um, now, that's not the algorithm's fault. Um, but it is something we need to be aware of, that, that we need our students to, to be able to work in a flexible way with these things and not just to mindlessly do them without thinking. Now, this is something that I did with some students. Um, it was a class that I don't teach normally. I'd never met them before, and I had to come in and teach a lesson with them. And I gave them this starter, which is from Smile. And it was basically four cal uh, sorry, eight calculations, and they just had to say um, whether they were right or wrong. Um, I did this just to get a sense of how strong their arithmetic was. Um, and they were really good, but there was one that we kind of disagreed on. They all thought that 35 times 20 equals 700 
100 was done incorrectly. Um, and I was really surprised by that. And I said, well, you know, that, how, how, what's wrong with that? Because if we do 35 times 2, we get 70. And, and 20 is 10 times bigger than 2. So we're going to have an answer 10 times bigger than 70. So that totally makes sense. And, and I, I couldn't see why they were unhappy with that one. And it turned out that they thought it should be drawn like this. They thought it should say 35 times 20 and that it should have a row of zeros and then the 700. And they, they actually thought it was wrong without the zeros. Now, this is um, because they were taught that they should always have that row. They were taught by their teacher at the time. And this was a class of year sevens and they'd done um, multiplication at the beginning of the year. And their teacher had been very um, direct with them that they had to follow the algorithm uh, to the to the book every time. So they had to have, first of all, multiply by the ones, have the row of ones, then multiply by the tens and have the row of tens. And in this case, there are no ones, um, but she still insisted they had that row of ones. Now, I've seen quite a few students do this, um, and I think that's really interesting. And it's, it sort of makes me a bit uncomfortable, this idea of we have to follow the algorithm and, and teachers will say, yeah, but then that then they'll remember the algorithm if they do it every time, no matter what the question is. It's just, you know, it's good practice for them to always follow the algorithm. Um, and it really, really makes me uncomfortable. That inclusion of that row of zeros um, is just not necessary. And to me, it just means they haven't looked at the question. They haven't thought about the question. Um, I actually saw a student, genuinely saw a student do this once. Um, I, he was asked to do 16 times 1,000. So he first of all um, did his zero. So he did 16 times zero. And then he did 16 times uh, the next zero. And he basically, he was doing it. And I, I, um, I wasn't his teacher. I just was in the room in this lesson and I saw him do it. And I said, um, I said, I tried to stop him and I said, you know, can we just think about a, a, what might be a, a, a quicker or nicer way of doing this question? Or do we do we need all these zeros? And he said, look, this is the way I've been taught to do it. And I just want to do it this way. Um, it's interesting that the that, that sort of lack of flexibility or being a, being able to adapt, being able to respond to different types of questions is really interesting. Um, it's, in, it's also interesting that the government says that this column method um, helps children to understand what's going on because the evidence, this evidence, suggests that um, they don't. They don't have a strong understanding. They have a strong um, fluency with the algorithm, but what they don't necessarily have is an understanding of why it works and what they're actually doing. There were lots of experts giving their opinion at the time of the changes or the, the suggested changes um, to the way that multiplication would be taught at primary schools. Um, and one of the things that was said at the time was that teaching methods like gridding and chunking had relieved one of the problems of failed maths teaching of the past century. And they said that by introducing these new methods, which were more intuitive, more logical, um, broke things down better, less algorithmic, um, it, it helped to relieve this problem. And the problem was that children who were taught traditional methods like the column method without understanding how they worked had little confidence in maths and they were fearful of it so the idea is that being maybe you can gain success by really understanding an algorithm um, but you won't necessarily gain confidence and you won't become the sort of mathematician who enjoys maths or um, embraces uh, problem solving because you've always you, it, it's such a kind of um, fragile structure that your understanding is built on um, so you know there's there's lots of there's lots of arguments either way here and I'm certainly not saying that um, that either method is better than the other like I've said before I don't have I don't state preferences for methods in maths I think it's way too complex to say one is better than the other but I don't think the government should be doing that either. Now, if we look at my list of um, drivers, what was it that caused the government to prescribe the column method at primary school? First of all, they said that the um, grid method was um, inefficient. And I'm saying I don't think that's necessarily true and I don't think it matters. They said that grid methods lead nowhere. And I think that's just nonsense. They said that long multiplication is used in high performing countries. Yep, I think they're right. And they said that um, grid methods are confusing while column methods are simpler. And I'd say that's really dubious. And I think it's probably the opposite. I think probably grid methods are simpler. Um, I don't think that they can say one or the other is a better method. Um, I don't think they should be saying that. But I certainly don't think that column methods are easy to understand in any way. 
And what I've done is I've added a fifth reason to the list of government drivers. And this is the unofficial one that they obviously would not admit anywhere, which is a fear of the unknown. They've all learned column at school. Um, all the government ministers involved in this decision, every, everyone involved in this decision probably went to school at a time where the column method was the method for multiplication. And that means that they've looked at these, they've gone into schools and seen them using these things they don't understand or they're just not familiar with. And they thought, oh, I don't like this. It's not what I'm familiar with. There must be something wrong with it. Now, I'm going to say that that is um, that seems crazy, but it's forgivable. It's very human. Um, when they try to change the way a lot of math was taught in the States, when they introduced Common Core and they try to change some of the methods to try and move away a bit from algorithms and help build in more understanding, lots of parents were very angry about it because they didn't recognize this new math that they called. It. Um, and actually, it wasn't. It's not new maths. This math has been around forever. Um, it's just a slightly different way of looking at it. Um, but really, it's the same thing. It's just a slightly different surface structure to how to do the calculations. Um, but a lot of teachers, uh, sorry, a lot of parents in America were really, really strongly opposed to it. And I feel that to some extent, this is what's kind of happened um, in this country, where some people have gone in and seen these this chunking and gridding happening in schools and said. Mm, that doesn't look familiar to us, and that means it must be bad. Um, now, like I say, I'm gonna I'm gonna say it's forgivable because I think it's quite a human thing to do. I think that lots of maths teachers are very stuck in their ways with methods, um, and that is just something that people do naturally. Um, but it is a shame that it would then go as far as to say, actually, we're going to force our um, our decision on every child in the country and say that every child in the country has to do maths exactly how we did it at school because we think that must be the right way. I think that is um, that is a regrettable decision and something that makes me quite uncomfortable. Uh, choosing methods is really complex. Choosing the mathematical method that we are going to teach to our students or that we're going to use ourselves is incredibly complex. In my book, I have this kind of um, grid of all these different things that we should think about. And there's loads like deciding when I have to decide which method I'm going to use for factorizing non-monic quadratics or for dividing uh, polynomials or for all the other things where there's a choice of methods. Um, I really agonise about it because I don't think that there are clear right answers. No one should ever be saying for anything, this method is best because it's complex. So for the government to come in and say this method is best is surprising. And I just not 100 percent sure that this is something that we should have allowed in this country. Um, and I think if the opportunity ever comes up again, then we really need to speak with one voice as a teaching profession, as mathematicians to say, we do not prescribe methods in mathematics. That is not what mathematics is about. It is unprecedented for the government of a country to say everyone has to do maths in this particular way. It's, it's, it's unprecedented and in my opinion, it's not OK. And I really hope that the opportunity to reform this comes up at some point. And again, I know that people tried to make the government listen before and they didn't. But I really think we need to, to, to make a strong case to say that mathematics is something where individually we choose the best methods for us. And we shouldn't have anyone tell us that, that a perfectly valid method is not allowed um, because that's just wrong. Uh, James Tanton says that math is for each of us to own and do in whatever good way suits us best. And I think that's really well said by James because it is a personal decision how we solve a problem. And I could try and solve the same problem as another maths teacher and I will come up with a totally different way of doing it. And no one can tell me that my way is not acceptable if it's a method that works and gets me the right answer. And for the government to be uh, kind of interfering in maths to such an extent that they're actually dictating the methods we're allowed to use really doesn't sit well with any mathematicians. Um, maths is uh, something where we can explore different methods and that's wonderful and we can play around with different ways of doing things and we can say hey look this way works and actually this way is equivalent to that way and it's just a different way of laying it out and all these things are worth exploring and worth doing and we shouldn't have those things um, removed by government directives where really the government have no place um, to be telling um, telling us how to do mathematics. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Gove is not one for listening to experts. I certainly am not an expert in this. I've done a little bit of research. There are people that know a lot more about this than me. Um, 
luckily it's not Mr Gove anymore so perhaps uh, when the opportunity comes up to reform this it will be someone who really actually listens to mathematicians um, and someone who is less um, set on um, the tradition and the, the methods they were taught when they were at school and the fact that they have this firm belief that they are, they, they are the right methods because there is no such thing as right methods. Um, I hope you found that interesting. Um, it's just something that I think is fascinating. It's something that I really wanted to explore. I was surprised when I found out that formal methods were prescribed at primary school. And now I understand a lot more about um, why that happened and what the arguments to, uh, for and against that situation were. Um, I hope you found it as interesting as I did. Um, thank you so much for listening.